many millions of people have to die before you might admit that you're wrong? Well, obviously more than 100 million, because that's the approximate total. That's probably an underestimate. But... Communists killed 70 million people in China, more than 20 million people in the Soviet Union, not including about 5 million Ukrainians. Great in theory, while disastrous in practice. 70 million people in China. More than... million because... Hello, everybody. Today we're going to look at the question, how many people really died from communism? I think it's time that we seriously approach this question from the left. Usually the right wing says communism killed millions and the left either stays silent or dismisses this as propaganda. But in this video we won't do that. We're going to have a look at the facts and the figures just as I did in the death toll of capitalism video. And in the end we will come to our own conclusions. Just for clarification, I will operate like in that video. If a death is the result of the mechanics of an, the economic system, it's a death that will count. That means if there is an imaginary system in which the death could be avoided, it will be counted. Stuff like murder are not the fault of the economic system and won't be counted. With that out of the way, let's start. What we're going to do is to find the highest number we can, which has sources behind it, and see how legitimate those claims are. And without wasting any more time, the highest number there is, with the source behind it, is 100 million. Yes, there are extremely biased pages on the web that claim that Stalin alone killed 60 million. They reached that number by counting every natural death in the USSR and adding the deaths of the German soldiers that invaded the Soviet Union, who were killed by the Red Army defending Russia. But the highest somewhat credible number is 100 million, in total, since 1917, worldwide. And to immediately disprove John Peterson, no, that's not the official estimate, not even close to be honest. It's the estimate of Stéphane Courtois, this guy. He's a director of research at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, excuse the pronunciation. To be more exact, it's from his book, which is called The Black Book of Communism. It was written by these guys. Courtois was the editor and in charge of many of the conclusions and suggestions of the book. Apparently the other authors didn't enjoy what he did with their research and every single one of them spoke out against the conclusions Courtois made. One said that Courtois was obsessed with arriving at a total of 100 million killed which resulted in sloppy and biased scholarship. We'll see what he meant later. As a full disclaimer, I did not actually read the full 900 page book. And I only read the chapters that were concerned with the points I'm talking about, along with external summaries to help me navigate the book. The link to the digitalized archive version of the book is in the description, so you can check if I took any quotes out of context or something like that. Oh, and also the book doesn't distinguish between socialism, communism and authoritarianism. Because of this I use socialism and communism interchangeably in this video as well. In the book Courtois claims that communist regimes killed approximately 100 million people in contrast to the approximately 25 million victims of the Nazis. He makes a direct comparison between the communists and the Nazis while diminishing the mass murders of the Nazis. Just in case you were wondering, the Nazis killed not only 25 million people but also started a world war that killed 75 million. Granted some of those died in the Japanese invasion of China which wasn't technically the Nazis but fascist so I think that should count for something. To pretend that the Nazis are only responsible for 25 million deaths is dishonest and quite possibly biased. So we haven't even looked at whether the communism number he came up with is correct and he already spread wrong information. I don't know why he tried to make the Nazis look less horrible than they were but I can speculate. And my guess is that he is biased against socialism. According to his co-authors he was obsessed with reaching a 100 million number and manipulated the data to make it fit. And then he says that the fascists only killed one fourth of the people they killed in order to make socialists look much worse. Anyways I've talked around the problem for long enough now. Let us look at what the book has to say. So here it is. 65 million in China, 20 million in the USSR. And to refute Prager, you, yes that is including the 5 million Ukrainians. More about that when we get to the USSR. Also it was only 4 million. The PRC and the USSR make up 85% of the deaths on this list. So they're what I will focus on. This script is looking long enough as it is. First let's look at the people who died in the Soviet Union. Here is what Courtois lists as the crimes that happened in the USSR. The execution of tens of thousands of hostages and prisoners. The murder of hundreds of thousands of rebellious workers and peasants from 1918 to 1922. The Russian famine of 1921 which caused the death of 5 million people. The de cossackization a policy of systematic repression against the Don Cossack. The murder of tens of thousands in concentration camps in the period between 1918 and 1930. The Great Purge which killed almost 690,000 people. The deportation of 2 million so-called kulaks from 1930 to 1932. 
the death of 4 million Ukrainians and 2 million others during the famine of 1932 and 1933. The deportations of Poles, Ukrainians, Moldovians and people from the Baltic states. The deportation of the Volga Germans. The deportation of the Crimea Tartars. Operation Lentil and deportation of the English in 1944. That's quite a list, isn't it? However, if you think about it, you have to ask yourself, is this really the people who were killed by the economic results of communism? Like, the executions of prisoners, which were wrong, no matter how you put it. But were they really the inevitable results of the application of what Karl Marx wrote? Remember, this book is called the Black Book of Communism, not the Black Book of the authoritarian regime of the Soviet Union. And those numbers are used time and time again to dismiss socialism as an evil genocidal ideology. I don't think it makes sense to blame socialism or communism for war crimes committed by Stalin. Don't get me wrong, I'm not excusing or ignoring war crimes here. I'm just denying that they're the fault of an economic system, which happens to be in place at the time. After all, we don't consider the Holocaust the fault of capitalism, do we? Because my video is about how many people communism killed, I will ignore people who didn't die as a result of the economic system. We will only count people who died as a result of socialist economy, not people who died because of an authoritarian regime ordering it. That includes these ones. We're going to take a look at those three others more closely. The first one is the Russian famine of 1921, which caused the death of 5 million people. You may notice that this happened right during the Russian Civil War. You know, the Civil War that killed 20 million people. Now, the causes of this famine are complex and I'd like to keep this video as short as possible, so I'll be brief. Essentially, during the Civil War, all parties fed their armies by taking food from the farmers in their territory. Compensation was sometimes fair and sometimes not. It's notable that the Red Army only took food as long as the peasants had enough food to supply themselves. So a lot of peasants decided to produce less food so that the Red Army wouldn't take any. At the same time, the Kulaks, who were sort of feudal landlords, they usually owned a lot more farmlands than they could work, so they had serfs working their land. Those Kulaks began to hide their food so the Red Army couldn't take it. They did so to later sell it on the black market. But remember, they didn't need it to survive, the occupying armies didn't take that much, the Kulaks just wanted to profit. So there were regular peasants deliberately producing very little and Kulaks hiding everything that their slaves, um, I mean serfs, had produced. Then there was a drought, which reduced the amount of food produced even further. And this is when the starving began. Upon having their soldiers starve, the armies decided to take more food from the peasants than normal. Remember, they were at war, which was the main priority of those in charge. Of course, this led to some farmers deliberately destroying their food source so the army couldn't take it, which made the problem even worse and led to even more deaths. So now, looking at this, we should ask ourselves, is this the fault of communism or the fault of the civil war and the drought? Remember, taking food from the peasants wasn't only a Soviet tactic. The white and black armies did the same thing, so if the capitalist armies had controlled Russia at the time, the same thing would have happened. So, to me this famine isn't the fault of communism, but the fault of the civil war and the individual decisions of the peasants. The next one is the deportation of two million so-called kulaks from 1930 to 1932. I've already explained that kulaks were feudal landowners, what a Marxist would call the bourgeoisie. For this you have to know that Russia was industrializing in 1926. Stalin moved many people from the land to the cities so that they could work in the factories. During this time the food production sank again and the Kulaks were accused of being responsible. Stalin decided that they were to blame and to be fair there was some evidence of that. And he decided to take their land and make them work like the other peasants. And yes, they weren't killed, they were relocated. Those 2 million supposed deaths are an exaggeration. 2 million is the total number of relocated Kulaks. About half a million of the Kulaks died during the transportation to their new lands. This is where we begin to feel the bias in the book. 2 million people getting relocated by an authoritarian government becomes 2 million people killed by communism, 1.5 million of which were fine in the end. So if you think that Stalin deciding to blame economic problems on the landowners is the fault of communism, you should add another half million to that counter. Personally, I'm not convinced that an instance of an authoritarian government deporting its people is somehow the fault of socialism itself. I just don't think that blaming communism for Stalin's crimes is fair. Again, this video is titled The Death Toll of Communism and not The Death Toll of Stalin, so I'm afraid I will dismiss those as crimes of Stalin. The last one is the death of 4 million Ukrainians and 2 million others during the famine of 1932 and 1933. This is the infamous Holodomor, which spawned a trillion memes about communists having no food. In short, what happened was that the amount of food produced in the Ukrainian SSR fell from 7.2 million tons to 4.3 million tons within a year. 
This predictably led to a lot of starvation among the population. The reasons for this fall in production are diverse. Some blame the collectivization, some blame the farmers for deliberately producing less so the government couldn't take any. Tankies like to blame the kulaks, who as mentioned before like to destroy their farmland before handing it over. However, none of those are the fault of socialism, are they? Those things are consequences of Stalin making decisions that led to those things. And remember, this is the death of communism, not Stalin. Communism as a political idea, not as every leader who called themselves communist. It's not the death toll of communists. To me, it seems like the Holodomor was a disaster brought upon by Stalin rather than by the nature of socialism. There is also quite some debate on whether or not the Holodomor was deliberately created by Stalin to weaken the Ukrainian people, which would make it a genocide. I'm going to ignore this debate because whether deliberately or not, doesn't matter because it was still a result of the actions of individuals and not the result of the mechanisms of socialism. Oh, and while we're at it, I was reading about the whole of the war on Christmas Eve because why not? And it turns out the Ukrainian government relies on this study which says there were 10 million victims. How did they arrive there? Easy, just take the actual victim count, which was 4 million, and add 6 million in reduced birth rates. How ridiculous! <laughs> why would anyone ever just add people who were never born to a death toll? What a ridiculous and obviously bad thing to do. Anyways, with the Soviet Union we end up with a total of... Well, not very much. We can see that a lot of Stalin's atrocities seem to be blamed on socialism, but if nobody can prove that those things are inherent to socialism, that's not a valid argument, I'm afraid. Yes, Stalin tried to implement socialism, and yes, the famines happened at the same time, but even children should know that correlation does not equal causation. Let's move on to Mao's China. 65 million supposedly died there. But just like with the number from the Soviet Union, this includes political prisoners and ethnic purges. Since, as I already explained, I don't consider those who died from orders by politicians victims of an economic system, we will ignore those once again. About the Chinese famine, Courtois writes, Loss of life linked to the famine in the years 1959 to 1961 was somewhere between 20 million and 43 million people. The lower end of the range is the official figure used by the Chinese government since 1988. This was quite possibly the worst famine, not just in the history of China, but in the history of the world. This is the Great Chinese Famine, and it really was the worst famine in recorded history, by any measure. However, the book assumes two things about it. First, that the high end of the death toll is correct, and second, that this famine was the result of socialist theory put in practice. About the death toll, I think it displays a nice bias that they use the highest possible number they can find, even though official sources assume way less. And about the famine being the result of communism? Well, we're gonna see about that. The Great Famine took place between 1959 and 1961 in certain regions of China. The official death toll is 15 million, which is 5 million less than what the book claims the official number is, but who cares about facts when writing an anti-communist Nazi downplaying propaganda book? The highest scholarly estimates go up to 30 million, which is still 13 million short of what Courtois claims. How do you go from 30 million to 43 million? Easy, just add the drop of birth rates and assume that people not getting kids is the same as kids starving. Yes, seriously, 13% of the total number of people communists supposedly killed didn't actually die or be born in the first place. Of course, you can make the argument that a drop in birth rates is a bad sign, but if your book loudly proclaims that 100 million people died from communism, then people will probably assume that those were actual people and not statistical birth rates. But what I love about this logic is the fact that if we count for reduction in births, every death killed an infinite amount of people, since the dead person can't have a child, so their children can't have children, so their children can't have children, and so on. From this we can conclude that the Holocaust killed an infinite amount of people, and so did the Armenian Genocide, and so did the Native American Genocide, and so on. The only problem with this logic is that it doesn't make sense in the way we think about death. We can only count those people who actually died, not those we imagined that would have lived. This is supposed to be an academic book on communism, not an alternative history scenario. Of course, there is some philosophical debate to be had on the topic of what counts as a death, but when your book proclaims that 13 million people who were never born are victims of communism, that just seems biased and is not honest. Anyways, let's move on. What caused the Great Chinese Famine? This again is a complicated question. Wikipedia says that the Great Famine was caused by a combination of social pressure, economic mismanagement, radical agricultural change in regulations imposed by the government organs, and natural disasters. Economist Xi Meng Nasi Qian and Pierre Jarrett came to the conclusion that there was no famine at all. 
at least knew not to an extent that would have led to starvation and that the deaths happened simply due to bad food distribution. However, for a diversity of reasons, food production was reduced. In this time period, the Chinese People's Republic was going through the Great Leap Forward. This was a plan of advances that was supposed to transport China from a practically feudalist society to a modern industrialized one. A big part of industrialization is moving people from farms to factories. Obviously, that means that those who are left doing the farm jobs have to be able to produce more. Of course, this wasn't lost in Mao and he decided to call in foreign experts to advise him on this. Because most capitalist countries didn't allow their experts to move to the PRC, they had to rely on Soviet scientists instead. One of them was named Terenti Malsev, who was a farmer slash scientist who worked with the old Union Lenin Academy of Agriculture, Science and Kurgan and Svedlovsk Agriculture Institute, or Vashknil for short. He had studied a lot of ways to make the fields more efficient and he came up with deep plowing. In this technique, seeds would be planted 1 to 2 meters below the ground rather than around 20 centimeters like before. The theory behind this was that the most fertile soil was below the ground and that there would be better root growth this way. In the hut laboratory, which Terenti used, that worked. But in practice, digging that deep mostly drove up useless rock soil and sand, which buried the useful topsoil and reduced the crop yield. Another invention Mao implemented was close planting. This one was invented by Torfim Lysenko who was a powerful and influential agronomist and biologist under Stalin. The idea was to first triple the density of seedlings and then double it again. This would mean that six times the plants would grow in the same space, which would greatly increase yield. According to Lysenko's theory, plants of the same species wouldn't compete for nutrients or sunlight. Of course, they did in practice, which greatly reduced the yield. The reason this failed is probably because only plants of the same genome, meaning the same family, don't compete. And in the lab, the test plants were probably related to each other, while the plants in practice weren't. Mao also started the Four Pests campaign, which, among others, designated sparrows as pests because they could eat the seeds from the fields. This backfired because killing sparrows led to an explosion in the numbers of bags and pests that destroyed the crops. And on top of all that, in 1960, an estimated 60% of the agricultural land in northern China received no rain at all for an entire year. At the same time, the Yellow River flooded, which killed 2 million people. I'll give you one guess as to whether Courtois also considers those 2 millions as victims of communist regimes. Now we have to ask ourselves, is it legitimate to blame the ideology Mao claimed to follow for his actions? Are deep plowing, close planting and the killing of sparrows result of the mechanisms of socialism or to be blamed on the decisions of experts who made mistakes? Couldn't we blame capitalist countries deny experts to China just as well? In conclusion, the 100 million number is definitely an acceleration. From the supposed 65 million in China, 13 million are just the estimated amount of reduced births at the time, which is, as I've mentioned, not the valid way to count deaths. Another 2 million is people who died in a flood, which is tragic, don't get me wrong, but it's not the fault of the People's Republic of China. 20 millions are victims of authoritarianism, meaning the secret police, concentration camps and deliberate mass killings by the state, stuff like that. The remaining 30 million is the high estimate of the Great Chinese Famine, which could just as well have been 50 million, according to more reliable sources, like the actual government of China. And even those 50 millions are not really victims of communism or socialism, but of a centralized incompetent government that mismanaged resources and tried to apply theoretical concepts on a large scale without previous testing. In the Soviet Union, 7 million of the deaths were people who were killed by the decisions and deportations of Stalin. Since we're counting the death toll of communism and not the death toll of Stalin, we have to dismiss those. Further 5 million were killed by the civil war and decisions made by the peasants. The next 2 million were people who accidentally died because of an order Stalin gave. Also it was only half a million, as I mentioned before. What is left is the 6 million deaths uh, Holdemore caused, which probably wasn't man-made. And if it was man-made, it was made by Stalin and not socialism. And if it was natural on the other hand, it still wasn't caused by socialism, was it? And those are the major two. The USSR and the PRC. Supposedly 85 million people died from communism in those two countries alone. But at closer inspections, that's not what happened. To assume that socialism or communism are responsible for those famines and tragedies would be the wrong conclusion. And don't get me wrong, there is a conclusion here besides Stalin and Mao were bad. Of course, you could conclude that. I know many anarchists would, but I think that we can learn more from this if we look closely. Orders of mass exterminations, collectivizations, deportations, failing firing methods and bad distribution of resources are things that have one common denominator. It would be easy to say communism because that one thing which is responsible did correlate with past attempts of socialist countries. Here's one more hint though. 
When Nazi Germany built up its industry to prepare for World War II, the death rate among the population increased by 10%. Did you catch it now? The deaths the Black Book names aren't victims of communism, they're victims of authoritarian governments who put economic advancements above the good of the people and made mistakes in the process. If Mao and Stalin were democratically elected and had to listen to a democratically elected parliament, they wouldn't have been in a position to endanger the food supply with new barely tested farming methods or to deport the kulaks in conditions like that. The Black Book of Communism really should have been called the Black Book of Authoritarianism. And while we're at it, it should not have counted victims of a flood and victims of famines caused by war. Not because they aren't important, but because that's not what the book is about. Oh, and it should not have downplayed the murders of the Nazis. That part really makes me think this is a neoliberal propaganda piece designed to demonize socialism. To its credit, looking at popular culture that seems to have worked, most people see an inevitable link between socialism, communism, authoritarianism and 100 million deaths. I hope my video helped to change that, at least a little bit. So in conclusion, question authority and remember that socialism isn't necessarily authoritarian, even though there used to be a correlation. Remember though, correlation does not equal causation. And on that note, thanks for watching. Please share this video with everyone who says that communism killed 100 million. And also like and comment so the algorithm may advertise my channel to more people. Would also subscribe so I can um, have one more subscriber than before. Also special thanks to Tsuyoshi for reading the quote from the book for me. Go follow him on Twitter. Until the next time. See ya.